So we're, we've talked about bone. I'm going to introduce you to the idea of articulations. And the truth of the matter is, I could literally spend the rest of the semester, I could spend the rest of the semester talking about articulations and doing a deep dive into each of the important articulations in the body and then the, the yogic correlates of all of these. Um, I am probably not. Well, I'll, I'll get to that. But what is an articulation? So uh, when you move your body, it happens at joints. Uh, we call these joints articulations where two bones, and I think I've said this before, to be articulate is to connect your mind and your tongue, to be articulate, to connect a thought with your ability to, to say it. And articulation in the body is one of those. Um, so the structure of that joint, there are, are different, uh, there's a range of categories of different joint structures. We're not going to go through all those categories because it's not super pertinent to all the yoga that we're doing. Or also it would, again, take us many, many lectures to cover uh, it in full. But uh, in general, the joint structure is going to determine the range of motion, the, the direction and distance of movement of whatever uh, part of the body that's, that's being moved across that joint. Um, so we have to understand, we're going to take some time to explore the uh, specific detailed structure of a joint. If we want to understand some specifics and details about the way uh, that joint is going to move. Um, and I didn't put a Patanjali on Patanjali's take home. I think there is one somewhere. Uh, but if I were to, it would be this line that Joint strength decreases as mobility increases. And conversely, uh, joint strength increases as the mobility decreases. So very immobile joints tend to be stronger. Very uh, mobile joints tend to be weaker. So here are just some very qualitative categories of some joints in the body that are uh, that are pertinent to yoga. These are joints that, um, so all, all of the joints in your body are going to get worked to a greater or lesser degree, but these are the ones that are really uh, relevant and, and um, are involved in yoga regularly. So uh, there are stable joints and mobile joints. Stable joints uh, are, for example, the scapula on the rib cage. So that scapular scapula, the elbow, uh, fairly, fairly stable joint, has a pretty limited range of movement. If you think <clears throat> about if my arm was fixed and I'm moving that joint, the, the area in space that that hand can occupy with this being fixed is really just a small arc, right, out of this whole range of possible space. Um, the, the foot is pretty limited range of movement. The knee joint, again, much like the elbow, has, you know, it can hinge for about 90 degrees, maybe, maybe 85, but that's about it. Mobile joint, uh, the neck. If you think about the neck, there's a fairly wide range. It's not just a hinge. It can go side to side and circumduct uh, around that axis. It can spin, right? There's a lot of motion in there. Um, the shoulder. Uh, thinking about the motion of the arm. Our arm can explore quite a bit of space. If you imagine the, the trace that this, my elbow or my hand is making in space as I move it around, it's a lot more than just that single uh, little arc that you would see at the elbow joint. There's a lot of places that that 
joint. Thoracic spine, uh, the wrist, the fairly mobile joint, but also not especially strong. The neck joint is not especially strong. You have to be careful with Yeah, yeah, sorry. Thank you for that. You're right. Uh, foot is actually uh, talking about, I, I misspoke. I, I said foot and then I showed you the ankle. This is the ankle. More wide. Foot. When I'm talking about the foot. I'm talking about like the flexing of, of the foot. Yeah, the joints inside the actual. Pardon me. No, no, that was great. You're thinking about what I'm saying. Thank you for that. You're right. Uh, and then ankles, yeah, ankles. I, I can attest to the fact that ankles uh, are weak if they're not uh, properly treated. So, uh, and I've highlighted that. Oh, yeah, right. So, um, you know, I would love to talk about all of these. And there's like a, a wide range of yoga poses that. Uh, relate to each of them, but um, I'm only going to talk about today, I'm only going to talk about the shoulder. Shoulder. And I'm not even really going to get a chance to cover the shoulder in the depth that does. Um, I could, if you guys want me to, talk uh, in, in future lectures about the hips and the knee. Because those are the next two most important joints, I think. The shoulder joint is, is huge because it's involved in so much of yoga. And it is, uh, it is one of those joints that the health of it is, is strongly correlated with quality of life as you get older. And it's also a joint that is, uh, because it is so mobile, it is, uh, it's kind of a weak joint and it gets injured very frequently. So doing things to support the joint health of the shoulder are important. And yoga is one of the ways we do that. So just thinking about the impacts of yoga and understanding of joints, I went to the, the joint that is the most vulnerable. And so I'll talk about that. If you guys want me to, I can make some lectures up. I have hips and knee already sketched out. I could, I could <coughs> throw some lectures together for that, but we can decide on that later. Uh, next week, on Tuesday, in lecture, I'm going to uh, give you, so Sarah is going to talk for a, a fair chunk of that class, and I will do a little bit of anatomical uh, and physiological underpinnings of what she's talking about. Um, and so that, But that is not going to be joints or anything. That's actually going to be more back on the original schedule that we had. I'm going to be talking about the, the brain and the parasympathetic. I'm not just going to throw hardcore stuff at you. I'm, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of the basics uh, that you'll need to understand her, her work. She's talking about. Uh, but I can come back to this at any point, and we can decide that. So that's something, you know, you as peers, you get to help me decide uh, what the class covers. That's what those... Uh, synovial joints. So um, we would call a synovial joint a diarthrosis. Di meaning two, arthrosis meaning bones, two bones. A synovial joint involves two bones. Uh, they're movable, and we find them at the ends of long bones. So, for example, uh, maybe this is a finger. And uh, what is this joint? Well, the joint is contained in this particular capsule that we talked about. It has the cartilages uh, on the two space and the two surfaces that are coming into contact with it. The joint cavity is fluid. There are the ligaments, the fibrous muscle that.
So uh, the synovial fluid, I've talked about it a little bit. I uh, Maybe last time or two times ago, I don't know, I showed the picture of the, the little orbies or whatever they're called, magnets repelling each other, and I talked about the proteoglycans and the glycosaminoglycans, all that stuff. Amazing that you followed me. So, uh, but it, it has that. I'm just reminding you that that's there. It's produced by the fibroblasts. That, and doing yoga. It, it, so on on what was that Tuesday? Uh, we got a, a wonderful reminder of this by Susan, uh, by Susan Golden. She talked about how the practice was progressive. Right, like by the end. We were doing some pretty intense stuff. She tried to get us to do handstands. Far out, man. That's cool. That was great. But we didn't jump right into that, did we? We warmed ourselves up. And the, the, like, the idea of warming yourself up is not like a myth. So the idea is that uh, the synovium is this slippery fluid that's going to lubricate the soft, smooth surfaces of the articular cartilages. And as you begin to move those over one another, the fluid warms up. It warms up. Has anybody ever kept their like olive oil or cooking oil of any sort in the refrigerator? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's quite thick, right? It's quite thick. Or, or even your maple syrup. Maple syrup that comes out of the fridge pours slowly. It it's much thicker, right? But then you, you have uh, your dad put a bunch of it in a saucepan on the stove and warm that up. You get some hot maple syrup over your, your uh, pancakes. It's on. Moving a lot faster, right? Sorry. You guys have to hear that. Um, so as the synovial fluid heats up, it becomes less viscous, and it uh, is a lot easier to be absorbed. It's a lot easier to be absorbed. So maybe you'll uh, remember, think of this. Uh, when you have a pancake and you pour cold syrup on it, a lot of times the syrup doesn't penetrate the, the, uh, penetrate the pancake immediately. It will run off the pancake. But if you put that hot maple syrup on the pancake, <coughs> it goes right into that pancake. So when you stick a pancake in your mouth, you are max. Max maple syrup. The articular cartilage. Because remember, it kind of looks like a pancake, right? It's, it's like a sponge. It has all those holes in it, the, the cocoonae with the chondrocytes in there. Um, so as the synovial fluid warms up, the articular cartilage is going to absorb it. This is great. This is what we want in the first place, right? We're trying to get fluid to go into that cartilage. As the cartilage soaks it up, just like a sponge, like you get those brand new sponges that are all dried out and weird, and you put it in the sink and they kind of blow up a little bit. Uh, same thing happens with the cartilage. It's gonna, it's gonna puff up and add more of a of a cushiony, uh, have a cushiony effect, protecting the ends of the pancake against impact and pressure. So this is why uh, a warm up period before getting into something vigorous. When you're doing uh, yoga, you want something to like gently warm the body. For example, in Ashtanga, uh, how do we, do you guys, throw your minds back to when I, I did some Ashtanga with you. How do we start that? Do you remember? Well, we, we did start with the meditation, then went, the first asana was uh, sun salutation. That's right. Uh, so, <clears throat> And it was just real easy, you know, just starting into dasana, doing the, the forward bends, stepping back, going through chaturanga, uh, upward dog, downward dog, vinyasa. Gentle, even motions, slowly warm the body and get yourself ready for the real business that comes. We've only, we only got to the sitting poses, but when you get to that, that uh, closing sequence in the ashtanga, it's serious, folks, and you do not want to be doing any of that stuff. Uh, we didn't get there, but uh, you don't want to be doing the, the later poses in the sequence without warming your body. So that sequence has been made with this concept and the 
idea of warming the synovial fluid uh, so that the cartilages can uh, absorb the synovium and be ready for uh, that, that uh, exercise. And this is also the thing, you, you hear yoga, uh, yoga instructors tell you, you know, go home and drink a bunch of water. You, all, they, you like hear that when you walk out of class all the time. And sure, that's important, but it's really important to be hydrated going into a yoga class, going into a yoga class, right? Because uh, that's when you want, that's, you know, that is the process whereby we're, we're working that tissue, flooding it, and if there's nobody home, we're, we can be sometimes doing more damage, right, if, if you're not hydrated before you're getting exercise, before you are doing it. Questions on that? So uh, what are the other things that make up uh, this these synovial fluids? So we have cartilages. Um, here's the knee. We're not going to really talk about the knee today, but there are these things called the menisci. Uh, the sky, there are these little uh, ridges, these, these pads, these sort of rings, I guess, that form a sort of cushioning buffer on the knee and help uh, the knee uh, to lock. Um, there can be fat pads in different places um, in a joint. So we're using the knee because it's the most common. Uh, we have, if you, if you feel your feel your uh, kneecap and then you go down a little bit, it's real small. And that's, that's a fat pad. It's a part of the joint structure. Um, there are a host of ligaments. We're not seeing a ton of them uh, in this. You can see the patellar ligament. But there's all kinds of, of ligaments that are going to hold uh, a joint together. The knee actually has a very complex set of ligaments. Uh, the cruciate ligaments, the collateral ligaments. Um, maybe if you guys decide to have me talk about the knee, we can uh, explore those more. Um, yeah, when you get a sprain, um, this is a ligament that has collagen fibers that have been torn. So this ankle that I'm dealing with uh, is because I uh, rolled the ankle really strong when I was your age and basically tore all of the ligaments on the outside of that ankle. Uh, and that's, um, it makes it difficult to do that. Uh, but not impossible. Yoga definitely helps. Okay, question. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, ligaments, yeah, are deformable, and they are remodeling themselves. So you know, if we if you think back to that uh, article that I showed you, uh, that was just talking about injury to connective tissue. That's all that that collagen is: is dense regular connective tissue, and with fibro uh, sites in there. And so when it it changes, it's going to be remodeling itself and uh, the collagen is has some tensile strength it will bring itself back to the original pose but it's going to continue to like turn over when you completely sever uh, a ligament that is a problem they don't grow back and reattach however when you completely tear it it surgical intervention Say that again. I guess you it's true. No, uh, because a ligament is not uh, a ligament is is not there by accident. A ligament is there to uh, stabilize the, the stabilize the the bony articulations that it's surrounding. Right, and without that ligament there, that articulation can sublux, uh, which or fully uh, have a full luxation, which is a complete dislocation. Right, so yeah, you need those ligaments. They they are there because countless generations have evolved uh, through natural selection. This creature 
has a shoulder that works, this one doesn't, this one eats and reproduces, this one doesn't. Right? Yes? Oh, geez. Well, I don't know. I don't know the exact details of your mom's surgery, right? <laughs> I mean, I uh, yes, it sounds like they have, they did something, you know. I, when was this? So she's, how old is your mom? She's. Okay, 55. So this happened 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, so. This was the 70s, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, why not take a tendon, staple it here, you know, just like that looks pretty good. Sort of the carpenter. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it works, right. You know, to, to a certain extent, like she's walking, right. She can't move her knee a lot. She's not going to be on the Rockettes or anything, but, um, you know, but, uh, yeah, she, she's functioning and she led a, a reasonably normal life, I imagine. Um, so. I guess it, it, it served its purpose. They perhaps advanced the surgical technique since then. So again, I, not to talk about my ankles all the time, but I, you, I have, so you know that I've torn all those ligaments on the outside of, of this ankle. And uh, that ankle now, without those ligaments, sometimes without having force on it, can spontaneously dislocate. And it's really attractive. It's a, it's a hassle. So you need uh, stability there. And for me, I've learned to use the peroneal muscles and the fibularis and all that stuff to stabilize the lateral, the muscles to stabilize the side of, of that ankle joint. But um, they had offered a surgery to me back when I did that, which was in the late 90s, um, to do kind of something similar to what they were going to do your mom. They were going to drill a hole to run this tendon through there. And I just said, okay, I'll be honest. I didn't. I didn't go for it. Maybe I should have. I don't know. Uh, but I guess like two oh, certainly it's going to. Yeah, yeah. Certainly it's going to. When you're changing, because it's changing the, the the like the 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 biomechanics, the structural mechanics of that joint when you're like rerouting forces uh, like that. So yeah, it, it changes the way that joint works, and then in so doing, is going to decrease the range of mobility. And we, we even, we had our, our, you know, uh, inverse correlation between strength and mobility anyways, right? So when you're strengthening it, uh, whether you're decreasing constructively or pathologically the, the range of motion, you, you can expect that to happen. So for example, on my ankle, I, I have too much of a range of motion or at least a pathologic in the way it should. Uh, okay, so any other questions there? Tendon, uh, tendons are uh, simply the connective tissue uh, that extends beyond muscle. I haven't really had a chance to talk about muscle yet, but we'll get there. Um, uh, as I had described in my ankle, uh, ten so tendons can support a joint in addition to and this is certainly the case in the shoulder. Bursa. Um, these are little like gel packs full of synovial fluid. Uh, they're they're kind of fun. So where's one here? So bursa uh, at the posterior. Posterior. A bunch of bursa throughout. There are these little packs of uh, synovial fluid that allow uh, motion uh, over uh, repetitive motion uh, along the range of motion uh, to happen without a lot of problems, particularly where the ligament would be rubbing the surface of the ankle. Remove a ligament, does that tendon 
is going to be rubbing in a way that might irritate the joint and the bursa prevent that. So when you get bursitis, that's an inflammation of a bursa and it makes the joint uh, quite difficult. All right. So um, we've got, these are all these factors that are going to stabilize. We said collagen fiber, uh, that the joint capsule articulating surfaces and the menisci, so sort of this lock and key uh, between the surfaces of the bones. Uh, other bones, muscle, fat pads, etc., can impact it, help stabilize it. Finally, these uh, articulating bones. Those are sort of summary of everything that I just went through, uh, helping to keep that joint stable. Right, it's pretty scribble. Any questions? All right. So range of motion. Let's define range of motion. Uh, I, we already have, I guess, but it's uh, it's just the the number of degrees through which uh, a joint can move in one of the three spatial uh, axes. Um, and so it is the most common. Uh, measure of joint performance. You talk about uh, how a joint is doing. You, you first thing you do is measure range of motion. That's what we did in the goniometry lab. We'll do it again at the end of the semester and see if anybody's range of motion has improved at all. Uh, it is the physical assessment uh, that's made when you're trying to see how flexible a joint is. So what what's going to determine the range of motion? Uh, specifically, it's going to be the structure of the articulating surfaces. Um, so, for example, my elbow, the olecranon of the ulna goes into the olecranon fossa of the humerus and prevents my elbow from, from hyperextending, from going beyond uh, where it's at. If the olecranon were removed, uh, your elbow point were removed, then you could bend your arm backwards and you'd be a hit at parties, but it'd be weird. Yes? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that? So it's yeah, yeah. Thanks. Hand the lecture off to you. That's great. Take it. You're totally right. Yeah. Um, so the elbow. Uh, when you see people like you, you hyperextend your elbow a little bit there. Um, you know, that is probably due to the architecture of the elbow in that person. Uh, there are people who are pathologically hyper flexible and they have joint uh, flexibility all over. That is probably not due to joint architecture and is often due to some sort of collagen defect that uh, allows these people to be uh, hypermobile. You think, wow, that's great, man. I'm going to be awesome on the yoga mat. Everybody's going to be so jealous of me. Uh, that's ego talking. Actually, those people have a really uh, hard time, actually, because uh, they have to be very careful at, with yoga, and they often have back pain and other problems, like they sublux locations very, very readily. Collagen is amazing stuff. It's it really is amazing stuff. It's the like it's the like tiny little sticky threads that hold your body together and there's a zillion different collagen defects that lead to all kinds of different things uh, that don't may not seem related at first but they are. So, uh, the range of motion is also a function of uh, how strong and tight the ligaments are. Do you have really tight ligaments? Do you have very loose ligaments? Do you have ligaments that are just right? Um, yeah, so as you, as you stretch a ligament, you're going to increase the range of motion. And uh, so-called double-jointed people are people whose ligaments are, are uh, longer than they should be. All right. And then lastly is uh, the action of the muscles. So, um, you know, we have these things called proprioceptors in the body, which are these nerve... Uh, endings that monitor the position of the body and uh, joint position and muscle 
cetera. Um, and if a joint is getting pushed to its limit, so for example, say you're hyper uh, rotating, externally rotating the hip or something, and you're like, whoa, that's a little much. Uh, those muscle stretch reflexes, the proprioceptors there are going to like whew, send signals to the brain. Brain says, whoa, dude, that's your hip, and sends a signal back down, and muscles will help protect uh, that joint. So that'll affect range of motion. And then baseline muscle tone. So what's the state of tension in resting muscles? This guy, I'm looking at him, man. He is the, he's what's that? Yeah. He, he is the... Uh, that he calls himself the, the Iranian Hulk. The Iran, he's a guy, he's a Persian dude. Uh, <laughs> the Hulk, yeah. Uh, but the thing is, you know, he would have a really hard time doing this. This is what is called muscle bound. That's, that's called muscle bound. So his baseline muscle tonus, he's got all these muscles, but he's probably not as strong as he looks, actually, uh, because those muscles are not. Uh, in peak, uh, we'll, we'll get into muscle structure later, so I won't get too deep into it. But uh, the the point here is that he has a reduced range of motion, right? Because he's got too much muscle that is restricting his and muscle that has not been properly toned. He has he's got a, a, a hypertonicity in uh, all that muscle that he's carrying, and so all he can do is walk around like this. Right, he can't. He can't actually do anything. Um, yeah, yeah. How do you get anything out of your <laughs> pants pocket? Get your wallet. I guess he doesn't pay for that. Grunt said, "Oh, no, I shouldn't make that." I'm not. Okay, so a simple model of articular motion. Um, I've been hitting this theme, a joint can't be mobile and strong. The, the more the mobility, the less uh, strength. So um, here are some ways that uh, joints can move. There's obviously, this is a C, D, and E. There was an A and B that I cut out because they didn't really apply to the um, Angular motion is this hinge motion. So, for example, in the shoulder, here's some hinge, uh, here's some hinge, all right, in two, di two dimensions. Uh, and circumduction uh, is really a form of angular motion. So, uh, circ circumduction happens when you are sort of sinusoidally uh, bending in an angular fashion across the bulk. Uh, these two are different than rotation. So circumduction would be like this, right? This would be like circumduction, and rotation would be, let's see if I can do it like this. Rotation is like this. So I'm not, I'm bending the elbow, so you're, I'm not confusing it with this. This is, this is rotate, femur rotating in the socket. That's different than circumduction. All right, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, shoulder, what we'll talk about, probably not hip. And if you guys want to, I'm, I, it's fine with me. This, there's only so much I can talk about. Um, and what, so I'm, I'm sort of honing in on these three joints, the, the knee, the uh, shoulder, hip. So there, there's these other types of joints. We're not going to worry about them showing a hinge joint. This is sort of a, a general schematic of what a hinge joint is and how it looks and it works. Uh, so the hinges in the body are the elbow, knee, ankle, finger joints. Those are all hinges. And they have what's called monaxial movement. I haven't defined what that means yet, but we'll see in a bit. It just means uh, motion across one axis. And then down here, is the ball and socket uh, that we find in the hip and the shoulder joints. We talk about that. Scapula, which is the socket. Humerus, which is the hip. It has this 
angular motion along two axes rotation. Our ball and socket tri axis. The shoulder and the hip joint. <coughs> put a green by that because we'll definitely talk about that another day. Hip is the next one I would want to do. If it's if it's we don't get there today. So uh, here is what I mean by axes of rotation. So uh, in the shoulder joint, I'm going to exclusively talk about the shoulder joint. Uh, that abduction is there's an axis of rotation that is coming this way, uh, whereas flexion, the, the axis of rotation is 90 degrees to it. It's going this way. And then uh, ro internal rotation, the axis. All right, so those are the uh, axes of rotation. In the shoulder joint, it is, it's a triaxial or multi-axial uh, joint that has three different uh, degrees of freedom or axes of freedom. Now, it can't rotate 360 degrees along all three axes, but it has a little bit along all three. Let's keep going. Let's review a little bit of the anatomy of the shoulder. So the, the bony landmarks, there's the scapula. Here's the scapular spine. This is the back, the posterior right scapula. There's the spine, which is the acromion, the head of the humerus. This is the clavicle. The clavicle joins with the acromion. Now on the front side of the, uh, the shoulder girdle, we have the humerus, uh, the scapula. Here is the acromion, the clavicle. But now we have this other bony projection that I didn't put on the list in case you didn't see it. Uh, but it's the coracoidal process. I did? Yeah. It's important. Coracoid, C O I D. Cor there's a, a coronoid, but it's another, another bone. It's not, it's not muddy the waters. So, shoulder joint. I've already said this a few times, but most movable joint. Ergo, the most unstable joint. Yeah, and because of all that, it is the most injured joint. All kinds of problems. There's dislocations, there's tears, there's crepitus. There's all kinds of problems. Repetus. Who wants that? Um... And it, it has these two important bony processes, the acromion, the crow's beak, right, that's coming out off the spine, and this other little finger that's wrapping around the cavity called both of them are the scapula. They're sort of projecting off laterally from the scapula, and they, and they uh, are above the humerus and, and sort of provide, help stabilize the humerus, but provide a bony anchor for ligaments uh, that are going to be important in stabilizing the joint. We shall see soon. Okay, next. Um, there are actually two joints that make up uh, the shoulder joint. And in fact, I could probably argue that there are three. So uh, there is the glenohumeral joint, glenoid cavity, the humeral, and then the acromion and clavicle, acromial clavic clavicular joint. And there's actually a third joint that um, we would consider when thinking about range of motion in the arm, and that is actually, actually the scapulothoracic joint, how the scapula runs along the surface of the Uh, they work together, all two, three of them work together to allow uh, an increase in the motion of the arm. So when, we're, when we sort of disarticulate the arm and look at it, um, it's not really a snug fit between the humerus and the scapula. It can only fit in there especially well. Uh, the humeral head is about two to three times larger 
than the socket that it's actually sitting in. So this articular surface is significantly larger than the surface that it's going to be in contact with. Uh, that's going to obviously increase the amount of mobility in the shoulder. Um, and it, it points a little bit medially and uh, it, it points medially, but also uh, posterior superior. The nuances of that would be important if we were going to get into a deeper dive of the sort of subtleties of certain poses, but I'm not really going to spend time on that. Um, and then there's the glenoid cavity itself. So it's a very shallow oval shape uh, that is pointing laterally, but uh, if one was pointing posterior superior, the other is anterior superior. Slight, slight. The glenoid cavity is facing forward just a little bit. The head is backward. Fit in there. But it's not a really snug, snug fit. Let's look at that joint cavity a little bit. Whoa, dude. Yeah, I couldn't. Uh, this was not an editable document, so I couldn't delete all those words. Don't lose your mind. All right, what I'm, what I'm trying to point out here, so the glenoid labrum, I, I apologize, I probably, if I had more time, I probably could have done a document on this, cut some of this. Um, what we're looking at, here is the glenoid cavity with the articular cartilage on it, uh, and then right around this margin, notice, we see the glenoid labrum. So I even pointed out the one. So, uh, you see that that labrum? It's labrum just means lip, right? So these are your labia, uh, your oral labia, up here, right? Labrum is a lip, um, and it is the glenoid labrum is this little lip of cartilage that kind of extends. The boundaries of that uh, glenoid cavity makes it a little bit bigger, uh, but in a flexible way. Makes it a flexible uh, sort of thing. This, uh, there's a lot of pathology with this. A lot of well-intentioned yogis tear that. And you don't want to do that. Don't want to tear that glenoid. Because then you get arthroscopic surgery. They go in there and like, it's not fun. I haven't had it, but um, I, don't, I don't want it. Um, all right. Yeah, they'll be overextending their arms and putting weight on it in a way that's not supported properly. Uh, you can you can do it and and you can mess yourself up in downward dog. Um, you know, the I'm not saying that Amy did anything but extremely responsible uh, yoga with us, but you she took us deep into some downward dog, right? Like we all were really reaching through the arms there. That was working that shoulder cavity quite a bit. Yeah, we're, we're pushing into that tissue for sure. And there are ways that you can uh, do various poses that is unsupported and can lead to uh, damage. All right, so here's some ligaments. There, there are actually five bundles of ligaments uh, that support the shoulder. They're all, uh, they're all important in one way or the other. I'm going to just point out a couple of them. Uh, there's the acromioclavicular ligament. This one often gets torn and gives, gives rise to drop shoulder. Um, yeah, you guys, you know, like football players get that. Yeah, it's, it's like anybody who's like that, like you see somebody who's like, being real macho and like throwing their shoulder to break a door down, really good way to tear your um, Yeah, well, just use the door. Um, and then there is the coracohumeral. This is not a good picture. I'll show you a better picture. The coracohumeral ligament is really important because it's the strongest of them. It gives you a lot of anterior uh, stability and prevents. Uh, anterior subluxation of the shoulder, uh, or, or in, in anterior or posterior. Important. Uh, 
But in general, with any of these ligaments, these ligaments are, you want to know the name of a ligament? Just think of two bony things in the shoulder that you could connect, and there's going to be a ligament named for the two of them. I mean, that, that's how it, it works, right? So there's glenohumeral, so it's going from the joint capsule to the humerus. Coracohumeral, going from the coracoid to the humerus. Um, the coracoacromial, uh, going from the coracoid to the acromion. The acromioclavicular. Um, and the coracoclavicular. So like all that stuff kind of gets glued together in all these different ways. All the stuff that can be attached gets attached to the ligament. All right, so here's just another picture and uh, the point of this is uh, simply to show very strong coracle the ligament is uh, post, uh, I'm sorry, anterior superior margin. It also uh, helps the, the shoulder stay in the socket when you're supporting your weight like this. So putting your hand, when you would be in upward facing dog or plank or something like that. Your work in that coracohumeral <clears throat> ligament. You you just hold on. We'll get there. Let's see how much time I got here. But yes, I'm heading there. Uh, there's a bunch of bursa in the so shoulder joint. The only one that I'm really going to point out because it does have some pathology associated with yoga is uh, this one, the subacromial bursa. It's right below the acromion. And uh, it is important because uh, once our arm goes past 90 degrees, once you get up here, at 90 degrees, that is all that the uh, glenohumeral joint will give you. If you want more than that, you're going to have to rotate the shoulder blade and you're compressing this bursa, right? So um, when you're way up here in this part of your range of motion, this is your shoulder blade rotating across the back. And by doing that, there's, there's a gentle and totally fine compression of that bursa. But it can be problematic in certain people. Uh, and you can get bursitis. Also, this, the unique architecture of every person's body in that region can affect uh, that bursa differently, of course. The other bursts, I just put them in there, but so here's an example. Uh, here we are past 90 degrees uh, in the arm. This arm is, is being uh, raised. Maybe they have a hypomobile scapula uh, for they have some adhesions, uh, neuromuscular adhesions or something like that, uh, or fascial adhesions that are keeping that shoulder blade from moving the way it should. Common, if you're not working that tissue, the posterior uh, these fatty sheets of the scapula, if you're not working that, you don't have nice mobile scapula. When you go to raise your arm, you want to get it up there, but uh, you're gonna you're gonna hurt that bursa. You're gonna hurt the bursa. It's all about shoulder blade mobility. Okay, on to your rotator cuff. Um, so, yeah, there, there's four muscles of the rotator cuff. And I'm going to have several slides here, so don't worry about getting it all in, in the first time around. But they are the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, uh, maybe I should have switched these, teres minor and subscapular. These three, one, two, and four on my list here, those are all posterior compartment. So, supraspinatus above the spine, we learned that in lab, spinatus below. I didn't put any teres in this list. Um, and then on the, on the anterior surface of the scapula, uh, so uh, the, <clears throat> the anterior surface of the scapula, you have the subscapularis. I can my scapula away and running my fingers up the scapula and so I'm touching the marginal fiber of of the scapula with my left hand on the right scapula okay 
So that's, uh, that's the uh, subscapularis. <clears throat> We've already established that the glenoid cavity is really shallow. And because of that, it's very mobile, but it's uh, not very stable. And this stability in the shoulder, keeping that shoulder a strong, stable joint, comes from the rotator cuff muscles, right? All those rotator cuff muscles that come around from a scapula and, and help hold that humeral head into the scapula, into the glenoid fossa of the shoulder. So here's a picture, another picture, the same thing. So here's posterior compartment. On the right-hand side, we have, uh, they're often called the sits muscles, sits. So in the posterior, there's supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, across the scapula coming onto the femoral head, or I'm sorry, humeral head. And then on the other side of the scapula, we have really deep dissection, a subscapularis also known. Diagram that people tiss rather than tiss. <laughs> tiss is uh, the name of the muscles as they uh, go from posterior to anterior. The way I get the picture, tiss. <laughs> yeah. So like the, the scapula would be here. These would be the fingers would be the muscles going across. Yeah, well, not like this, actually. Uh, the tis muscles, or sits muscles, or whatever. Let's, let's keep going. Oh, man, I'm going to run out of time. So, <coughs> thank you. Uh, uh, so here's, here's, sort of a, here's sort of a summary slide that Patanjali is going to boil down for us. But uh, what leads to this high range of motion? So it's a ball and socket, which we've already established is triaxial. So there's a lot of possible motion in a ball and socket. Uh, that articular surface area ratio, we said the humeral head to the uh, glenoid cavity is like two-thirds. It's one of the reasons the shoulder blade is so flexible. Uh, the glenoid labrum is going to extend that bony socket, and uh, part, so part of the socket is this squishy cartilage on a lip instead of a bony lip. Um, and we get support from the acromion and coracoid, uh, but that because a lot of the support is coming from something external to the actual articulation, that's going to ex expand the uh, range of motion. There's all kinds of ligaments and bursa that are going to stabilize that, but enable it to have, so that stability is going to uh, enable the joint to explore a wider range. Rotator cuffs, another way of stabilizing that joint. So structure of the shoulder allows a wide range of unstable motion. All right, so let's, let's see if I can get to some yoga here. Yeah, I want to get to some actual yoga. Uh, but I, I need to to, again, button down exactly what we mean by abduction. So I always like, oh, abduction, here it is, right? Uh, but it's not just that. So the motion of the scapula is giving you all of this abduction. So the, if I were to keep the scapula pinned to the, to the back, which is kind of hard to do, to really think about pulling the shoulder blade in towards the midline as you raise your I mean, we ask you to do this in yoga often. And so when I'm going up like this, keeping shoulder blades into the back like that, you know, keeping the, the shoulders, skin between the shoulder blades soft, you hear them say that a lot, as the arms go up. Um, that's fine up into here, but if you were to watch my shoulders as I keep going, those shoulder blades would suddenly go whoop. They would, they would move away from each other. And they rotate, they pivot on this point so you're seeing as the shoulder, the, the arm uh, abducts into the further reaches of its range, it's not actually the, the glenohumeral joint anymore. It's the scapula of the thoracic going along. If you want to, these pictures all came out of that text that I gave you, if you want to read the text.
the text goes a little bit deeper than I'm going to be able to. So what are the muscles of this? Uh, abduction, so that's uh, partly supraspinatus. Uh, and the supraspinatus, so in general, in any muscle, in any uh, joint motion, the deepest muscles are the ones that start it. The deepest muscles are the ones that start uh, the motion. And supraspinatus is super deep, so it's going to get the first 15 degrees of the ball rolling. Deltoids uh, take us up to 90. At that point, uh, that joint has given us everything it can, and the trapezius and serratus anterior, which are responsible for moving the scapula, they take over. Um, and uh, and uh, upwardly rotate that scapula. So I'm going to leave it there.